All right, welcome to class number three, and we want to welcome all of those that are watching on the internet. We're live right now, and uh, we welcome all of you that are watching uh, wherever you might be watching from. And we know we have a lot of internet watchers in this area, but also in other states and other uh, parts of the country, and we're excited about that. These classes are being recorded. We have class one and two available on CD, and next week we'll have class three and four, the ones we're doing tonight, available. So you can get them as we kind of go along. And some people like to have them. They can play them in their car or, uh, or you know, as they, they have a CD player they carry with them uh, wherever they go. And that's kind of nice. Uh, these also may become available on DVD if, you, uh, if we get enough interest to uh, make series in, on DVD, then you can have those to uh, play the classes uh, visually. We do know that um, a number of people use these uh, to actually facilitate a class and they'll play a, a DVD or a CD for a Sunday school class or for a home Bible study and it makes it real easy to have one. You just get people, play it, have some discussion, have some refreshments and, and then send everybody home and uh, it works out real, real well. And so just a, an idea for uh, some that might want to use it in that way and also as an evangelistic tool. All right, we're going to begin in uh, John 3, and this is uh, where we left off. And this is John's Gospel, Chapter 3, and what a wonderful book this book is. Here we have, of course, one of the, uh, I guess, best-known chapters in John's Gospel, but it is not without its difficulties, and amazingly, uh, many cults and different denominations will absolutely twist what this chapter says. So we're going to take a look at what is going on here and we'll point out those things as we go. Verse 1 says, there was a man of the Pharisees. That was one of the denominations, you might say, of that time, a sect of the Jews. These were leaders in Israel, uh, usually very learned, intelligent folks who... Uh, really uh, led the country and uh, were very important in those days. And he, his name was Nicodemus. And notice it says here that he was a ruler of the Jews. He was one of the leadership of Israel. It was the Pharisees that pretty much were responsible for taking Christ uh, to Pilate and, and having him uh, executed by crucifixion. Verse 2 says, The same came to Jesus by night. Interesting, he comes by night, and we believe he gets saved in the middle of the night. You hear so often evangelists say you have to come publicly to Christ, or you can't be saved. This is obviously not correct teaching, as you see here. Uh, here was a man who came secretly. You don't have to come publicly. As long as you come to Christ, you're saved. It doesn't say, come unto me publicly. It doesn't say... You can't come unto me privately or secretly. Obviously, uh, Nicodemus was one who uh, uh, really was curious but didn't want to stir or call attention to himself. And so here he comes uh, with nobody else around. And that's not unusual. I remember at the University of Florida, uh, when I let it be known that I was a Christian, I began to witness. I remember a lot of guys would, uh, in public or around others, would really give me a hard time and laugh or make fun or whatever of the fact that I was a believer in Christ. But I had many incidents when at night they would come knock on my door and then they would say, could I talk to you? And it was wonderful to see that. And, and of course, I never put them down for how they treated me in public. I always invited them right in and was able to lead a lot of these guys to Christ. So it's not unusual for somebody to come quietly or secretly. They want to carry on their image with their friends, but uh, when you get right down to it, they have a hunger and a desire to know, and some of them come secretly. So many a time I'd get a knock on my dorm room at the University of Florida, and it was somebody that would ridicule me when his friends were around, but would come secretly at night and say, I, I want to talk to you. So that's neat, and that's what happened here with Nicodemus. He came privately, secretly, and when you hear evangelists say you have to come publicly, I think they're trying to be self-serving there because they want you to 
make a public statement, walk forward in their crusade or in the church service, and it's not really so much about you, it's more about them and how people uh, see the uh, outward um, movement of people coming forward and, and it's a feather in their cap and it's not so much that they care about your salvation. Well, here was a man who came by night, a ruler of the Jews, a man who was a Pharisee, and notice he says, Rabbi, which means teacher. And obviously, Jesus Christ is the greatest teacher who ever lived. He's God, and certainly he uh, knew how to uh, get his points across. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now that sounds real good, but actually that statement is wrong. And Nicodemus is an unsaved man at this point, and the Bible under inspiration records uh, people's conclusions. But we know that there are men that can do miracles that are not from God. So we have to really... Be alert to that. So when you read something in the Bible, you have to ask yourself, who's speaking? And Nicodemus is speaking. Was he saved? No. This was the conclusion that he had drawn. And so many make this conclusion that when they see those people who do signs and wonders, they feel like these people have to be from God. And I think most of them are a counterfeit and are not from God. So let's just take a quick look here at the Old Testament. If you'll turn with me, to the book of Deuteronomy. You might say, do to who? Uh, this is Deuteronomy, the fifth book of your Bible. Moses is the human writer. We're going to turn to chapter 13, and it's kind of interesting how this kind of falls uh, to be chapter 13 because it's talking about false prophets. It seems like the number 13 always gets associated with Satan, doesn't it? And that's why people are superstitious about the number 13. You'll go into some buildings and you'll look at the numbers on the, uh, that you can punch to go up the elevator and you see 12 and you see 14 and there's no 13 when in reality the 14th floor is the 13th floor and uh, you just uh, know that people are trying to avoid that number and because it is the number uh, that is associated oftentimes with Satan. Certainly we see the number 13 prominent when the Lord's Supper was introduced, we had uh, the 12 disciples plus Christ. That's 13 people. And guess what? One of those was dismissed as Christ instituted the Lord's Supper and was not present when actually he instituted the Lord's Supper because Judas was never a believer and Judas was the 13th man and he was the one that was indwelt by Satan as Satan indwelt him. And, of course, he was used by Satan to betray Christ and, and uh, obviously to bring the connection between the soldiers and the arrest that night and uh, the uh, trial and, 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 of course, Christ being taken to the cross. So uh, 13 seems to fit everywhere. But here we have this uh, chapter. It says in verse 1 of chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, If there arise among you a prophet, the modern word would be preacher, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. So here we have a teacher, a preacher, coming along, offering a sign or a miracle. And then it says in verse 2, and the sign or wonder come to pass. So they actually can pull off a miracle. Whoa, <laughs> interesting, isn't it? Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let's go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. That's a false message. And that's how you judge any preacher. And you'll notice it says in verse 3, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not listen, hearken unto the words of that prophet. Don't you listen, even if they can promise a miracle and it happens. Because false prophets can do that. And the test is, does he teach what God taught or the Bible teaches or what Christ says and if they don't agree with the Bible, then they're wrong. You, it doesn't matter whether they can do a miracle or not. But a lot of people are fooled. They see some, somebody supposedly do a miracle, and they say, oh, they're from God, because they assume that only God can do miracles. But Satan has great power, and he can do miracles. So don't fall for that. i never forget 
I was visiting out in the neighborhood here, and I knocked on the door of a home where uh, I tried to lead this man to Christ. And uh, he said he was a member of a satanic group. And that Satan had healed his wife's leg. And I said, I don't doubt it. So he said, I am obligated to Satan because of what he did for my wife. And I said, you know what Satan thinks about you? He says, you are one of those big suckers on the block. Because you will now reject truth because of this so-called miracle that he did, which I don't doubt that Satan has the power to do that. But one day, you're going to go to hell with Satan, and in hell, Satan's going to laugh at you and say, what a sucker you were. And I really believe that. Anyway, I was intimidating him and giving him a hard time because I wanted him to be shaken loose from that so that he would trust the Lord. And I don't normally go hard after somebody unless I feel like they're not going to come loose unless you use a jackhammer or a two-by-four to get their attention. In this particular case, I told him, I said, Satan's going to laugh at you, and you are a big sucker if you fall for that. I still couldn't shake him loose. He was bound and determined to be loyal in his faith to Satan because Satan did miracles. So he openly was admitting his was coming from the devil's side or the dark side, but still he would not turn to receive the truth. So that's a warning, and I don't want to spend much more time on this. We could go a whole hour just on this topic and show that miracles can come from the dark side. Let's, let's go back here and just examine this. And it's, it's a good lesson here in, in how to interpret your Bible and how to be a good uh, Bible student and how to be able to separate uh, truth from error and make sure that when you're studying your Bible, you compare Scripture with Scripture. And here, obviously, Nicodemus had drawn a conclusion that was really not correct. But yet, he was correct in that Christ was a teacher sent from God. So he was right on with that. But he made a mistake in what he said here. Rabbi, chapter 3, verse 2 of John. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. Reason why, for, or because? No man can do those or these miracles which you do except God be with him. Wrong answer. We know that that part is not true. And... Uh, one of the healers of a uh, uh, couple decades ago, A.A. Uh, a. Allen, used to have the big drop by, by, backdrop in his tent meetings. And it would always say, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. What was he saying to the audience that came? That he was a man sent from God. And that was a lie. And uh, eventually, A.A. A. Allen died of cirrhosis of the liver. He was an alcoholic. And and a very powerful, though, uh, healer and well-known across the country. But uh, he obviously couldn't heal himself. And that is uh, usually uh, the case. And these people have a false message. You need to be careful of that. So then we find in verse 3, Jesus didn't really uh, address that issue. Uh, he uh, let that go by. Sometimes when we're witnessing, uh, there are things that are not really worth spending a lot of time picking up on. And you might just tackle somebody that makes a statement like that and, and beat them in the ground with it. And it's not going to be uh, in your best interest as far as leading them to Christ. So uh, I think Jesus being a, uh, a master teacher and, and a real uh, a person who knew uh, our psyche as uh, human beings uh, went right for the real, real thing that needed to be discussed. And that was this man's salvation. Nicodemus needed to be saved. So Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto thee. Now Christ is God and he cannot lie. Titus 1, 2 says God cannot lie. But what he's saying here, this is a truth that is extremely important. So whenever you see a verily, verily verse, uh, this is a truth that you need to pause and reflect on and, and uh, don't miss the point that he's making when you have a verse like this. So he says here, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, so here he introduces the fact that you have to have a brand new birth to be able to enter heaven. Notice we're now uh, on a track toward are you going to go to heaven when you die? And that's kind of the focus I've adapted here as well. And our track in the back 
says, am I going to heaven? It's a great conversation opener, and it focuses you, uh, puts the focus right where it needs to be, and that is, is that person uh, going to go to heaven? And we find here, Nicodemus became confused. And uh, that's why I believe if you're going to use the phrase, uh, you must be born again, you need to explain it. Or the person listening may become confused. Certainly if Christ used it, and his listener, the hearer, got confused, then you can expect that somebody's going to get confused when you use that term. There are some churches that love to talk about that. You must be born again. You must be born again. But they don't really explain, so they leave their listeners also confused, and they don't really know what you're talking about. When Billy Carter, or rather Jimmy Carter, became president of the United States, he used that phrase uh, that he was born again. And wow, it just... Uh, seemed like it went everywhere and got used by everybody for whatever uh, was going on in their life. If they had a, uh, as a baseball player, a slump in their in their hitting, and they got their uh, hitting back, they would say they were born again. And uh, if they had a business and it wasn't doing well, and all of a sudden uh, they turn the corner and they start making money money again, they said their business was born again. And uh, you'd hear it for everything. It didn't matter. Uh, what was going on, but they would apply it. And so it just kind of got washed out, and nobody paid any attention to what it meant, and usually people got a wrong answer out of it. And most people generally think it means some type of reformation or change on your part, and that's not what being born again. This is a spiritual birth it's talking about, and has nothing to do with anything that you do, but it's the result of what God has done for you, and it's something that God does, for everyone who believes, you become born into God's family. So here it says in verse 4, notice how Nicodemus drew a wrong conclusion. Again, here's what happens with unsaved people. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 2.14? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them, neither can they know them, because they're spiritually discerned. He starts right out with the first words out of his mouth, and he didn't have it right. No man can do these miracles except God be with him. That was not true. Now he's confused again because he doesn't really know what this being born again is all about. And so he says here, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? I believe he's talking about himself. He's an older man. Uh, and usually the Pharisees were older men. They didn't just all of a sudden walk up as a 20-year-old and say, I want to be a Pharisee. And, and they let him into that elite body, uh, he was an older man. And here now he's pondering, what are you talking about? How can a man be born when he's old? And notice he gets pretty specific here. He says, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He says, here I'm an old man. And his mother was probably near death, if not already dead. And he's saying, how can I go back into my mother's womb and then come out a second time and be born again? Obviously, he was thinking in terms of the flesh birth, the natural birth, and Christ here is not talking about that at all. And so Jesus then goes a little further in verse 5 to clarify, and Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I believe that this, without a doubt, is talking about the natural birth. It's uh, called uh, the water birth. When uh, a woman is about ready to deliver, the water sack breaks, and not too long thereafter, uh, the child comes out. And uh, here he's talking about going back into his mother's womb, and notice Christ is saying, except a man be born of water, which is the first birth, the flesh birth, which, by the way, is implied here that Nicodemus already had that one. And it says here, and you have to have the second birth, which is of the Spirit. So you've been born once, Nicodemus. You have to have two births to be able to go to heaven. You have to have the birth of water, which makes you a member of the human race, and of the Spirit. And unless you do that, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice the phrase in the end of verse 3, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And verse 5 says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So until the new birth, you really are in the dark, and you're also not a member of God's family. And then it says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh, and this is a confirmation that we have the right answer here, because notice again it talks about the flesh birth. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he's talking about the birth of water being the flesh birth. He's talking about the birth of the Spirit being the spirit birth. And the flesh birth never becomes anything but flesh. You can take the flesh birth, which we all have, and reform it, get it to promise things, get it to go to church, get it to look nice, and uh, use deodorant or slick up their hair or whatever, and still it's flesh. And according to the Bible, that's not going to get you to heaven. You have to have the second birth, which is the birth of the Spirit. So he says in verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born what? Again, implying that he already had the one birth, the flesh birth, the birth of the flesh, the water birth, but he needed to have a second birth now, which is the birth of the Spirit. Now it's amazing how many groups are desperate to find a verse to support works or salvation, and they teach water baptism is essential for salvation, and they turn to John 3, 5 as a proof text. I can't tell you how many people have said, you have to be water baptized to be able to go to heaven. Could you show me that in the Bible? Oh, yes. Where would you turn to demonstrate that? Well, John 3, 5. And then I will oftentimes ask them, read the verse to me. And they'll say, uh, no problem. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be baptized of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I'll say, you know, somehow I'm, I missed that. Would you read it slower and do that one more time? And they'll say, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be baptized of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I'll say, again, I'm sorry, I'm missing the baptism part here. Would you take your finger and do that one more time and point out the word baptized to me? No problem. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be baptized. And all of a sudden they realize that they have read a different word into it that's not even there. This is what happens when people get brainwashed. I really like to turn that around and say they get brain dirtied. I believe when you really figure out what the scriptures are saying, then your mind is cleaned up. So brainwashing is really reading the scriptures and having your mind cleansed. But a lot of people are brain dirtied and need to come to the truth of the Bible so that they're brainwashed and get it right. Well, these groups are so indoctrinated with this that they actually will read the word baptized right into the text. Guess what? The Roman Catholic Church teaches this, and they'll use this as a proof text that you have to get that baby baptized if you want that baby to ever enter heaven. And so uh, people of Catholic faith, what? As soon as that child is born, very shortly thereafter, they race them over to the Catholic Church to be baptized. If you're Lutheran, Guess what? You race that baby over there to be baptized. Of course, the Lutherans and the, and the Roman Catholic Church and the Presbyterians all sprinkle that little baby. And uh, that, of course, I don't believe is baptism as taught in the Bible. Baptism is immersion. But guess what? <clears throat> there is no such thing in the Bible as infant baptism. You cannot find an example of one infant ever being baptized. Baptism is a testimonial on the part of a believer that has trusted Christ and now wants to ceremonially picture the fact that they were cleansed of their sin by the blood of Christ. The water is just ceremonial. And uh, the water doesn't save and the water can't wash away your sin. And the great example is what Christ gave us with the two thieves that were crucified. One believed, one didn't believe. The one that believed was saved and he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But he never was water baptized, was he? No. And the water baptism doesn't save. Then some people say, well, he was in the Old Testament era, and uh, that was different. But stop them in their tracks, because the thieves, what? They died after Jesus died, so they're in the New Testament era. You know, Jesus, when the soldiers came, to speed up the crucifixion, found Christ already dead. And then they took these big planks and broke the legs of both thieves, which of course meant that they could no longer push up to get a gasp of air, and they suffocated and died. That's, that's the way they would speed up crucifixion, because a person suspended like this can exhale, but they have to push up with 
uh, their feet, which are spiked together, to catch the next breath, and then they slumped down and exhaled, and they had to do this until they became exhausted. And so the real means of, uh, or the real uh, medical reason why a person dies who's being crucified is that they suffocate. And so they would speed that up by breaking their knees. They would bring a, like a baseball bat and swing it right across their knees and break their legs, and then they would just slump and they would suffocate. Well, Christ was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. And the Bible says in John 19 that the scripture might be fulfilled back from Psalm 35 in the Old Testament that not a bone in his body would be broken. Isn't that amazing? You know, if those soldiers just went ahead and broke Christ's legs, they would have broken scripture. Uh, because the scripture said that the Messiah's bones would not be broken, not one of them. So his bones were not broken. But then they found the uh, thieves were still alive and they broke their bones. So they died in the New Testament. Since Christ is the dividing point, they didn't die in the Old Testament. So remember that when you're debating with some of these people. They'll say, oh, well, that was Old Testament. No, it wasn't. They died after Christ died, so that's New Testament, and it's a great illustration. But uh, no doubt, water can never wash away your sin. But even the cults teach this. Did you know the Mormons will try to tell you that you have to be water baptized to get into heaven? That's right, the Mormons even teach that. And they practice water baptism in the Mormon temple. And so water baptism is taught by many different groups as a means of salvation. And I've had Mormons come to my door and tell me that you have to be water baptized. Where do you find that in the Bible? John 3, 5. So it's, it's a popular one to go to. But I always like to say, you know, there's a tremendous difference between being born and being baptized. And if you don't know the difference, then I think you've got problems. <laughs> if your wife is pregnant, are you going to race her to the church? for baptism, or are you going to take her to the hospital for that child to be born? I, I hope you know the difference between being born and being baptized. And you might just focus on that word born. It's not baptized, and it's a birth. And of course, that's what it's saying. In verse 6, that which is what? It doesn't say baptized of the flesh. It says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. I wanted to make that point clear because uh, you're going to have people come after you. I had a, asked to me this week after a radio show. A guy called in and said, Oh, Pastor, I don't know how to answer this. This is a tough one. I was told you have to be water baptized to be able to be saved. And they pointed out John 3, 5. And the guy panicked and thought it, maybe it was saying that. And I said, Come on. There's a difference between being born and being baptized. What does it say? It talks about a birth of water not a baptism of water. Oh, thank God, he says, I'm, I feel relieved. <laughs> and it was, it's such a simple explanation. But this guy panicked because the churches will come at you and say, it's talking about baptism. And, and if you don't know anything, you might say, well, oh, maybe he's right. But it's clearly, on, in verse 4, it's talking about the flesh birth. Verse 6, is talking about the flesh birth. So on either side of verse 5, clearly the interpretation is, this is talking about a birth, the natural birth, where you're enclosed in a sack of water in your mother's womb. When the water sack breaks, then the child comes out. And that's what it's talking about. And then Christ said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Now the way we become born again is by receiving Christ as our Savior. We already covered this last week, but let's just briefly go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 12, where it says, But as many as what? received him, him, the person of Christ. To them, God gave power, or gave he, God, power, or authority to become what? The sons of God. And then it says, scratch out the word even, it's in italics, not in the original, to them that what? Believe on his name. So when you believe, the word believe means to trust. When you trust on Jesus, on Jesus being the one that his name declares that he is, that he's God who would save you, uh, then you become born again. God grants authority for you to become born into the family of God. You become a son of God at the moment you believe on Christ's name and believe that Christ is indeed the Savior. Verse 13 goes on to say that, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of what? God. 
So if you scratch out all that middle part of verse 13, not that it's not important, but the, the bottom line is it says, which were born of God. If you read verse 13 without the middle part, that is a qualifying uh, part that says, it's not of the will of the flesh, it's not of blood, it's not of the will of man. But this is a birth of God, and God is the one who grants authority, verse 12, to those who receive Christ by believing who he is, that he is the Savior who died for you, and trusting him that God grants authority or power for you to become God's son. Look, if you will, now at Romans chapter 8, and I want to uh, have you become familiar with this one as well. I love this passage because here it talks about what happens to many people. They think somehow that they're automatically for some reason, uh, God's children. And the Bible says that is not true. Verse 6, Romans 9, page 1202. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Page 1202, chapter 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. What is it saying? Well, verse 8 really clarifies it. It says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh. Now, we just talked about being born of the flesh. So those which are children of the flesh, these are not, these are not, these are not, these are not. Chapter 9, verse 8, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise, the promise was Christ. All the way back there to Abraham in Genesis 15. The promise, which is Christ, these are that are children of Christ or of the promise are counted for the seed. So to be a member of God's family, you have to be one that has believed in the promise that God gave from the get-go in the book of Genesis that uh, this Messiah would come of the seed of Abraham. And if you would only believe on him, trusting in him, you would be saved. And then you become a child of God. So just because you're born physically uh, doesn't make you a child of God. And yet this is a, a big heresy that many people have bought into called the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And many groups teach it, and many of the cults teach it for sure, that God is the father of everyone, that we're all God's children. And you maybe have heard some of the spirituals that have been sung about how we're all God's children and so on. And we're not. Uh, we are God's creation, and God is our creator, but we're not God's children till we're born again, till we have the new birth. That's important. I'll never forget going to one of these ecumenical prayer things one time, and they had about eight different ministers pray, and you could tell by their prayer which ones were saved and which weren't. And uh, it was easy. One of them in particular said, Creator God, obviously they're missing the point here. Uh, and if you even say Father God, you can't really, really say that unless you're born again because God is not your Father. But uh, a lot of terms that are used will uh, kind of let you know where they are. Uh, I have found, this is just a sidebar here, that those groups that talk a lot about Jesus being the master. And when that term, the master, is used, usually those people are not straight. They don't usually get it. They usually deny the deity of Christ and just take him out to be a great teacher, great leader, great religious person, one that we ought to follow his example, one that we ought to uh, learn uh, from how he lived his life, but fail to realize that this is God in flesh. So uh, watch out. Uh, you'll find that a lot of churches... We'll use that phrase, and it's just a tip-off. You need to, of course, dig a little deeper to make sure that you're right on that, but usually those are little flags. When I hear preachers that talk about the Master, and we need to follow the Master, I say, this guy has no clue what's going on here. He's probably not saved. So uh, these are little things that I've learned over, the, over time, that if you just use those as little flags, then you check a little deeper, and all of a sudden you're forewarned, this guy may not be saved. We have many ministers that are not saved. And uh, they generally don't address Christ by his full name, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
which tells us that he is the Lord and that he is uh, the contraction which is translated Jesus, Yeshua, which means God who would save you and that he's the Messiah, the Christ. And uh, that's, I think, the term that we really ought to use if we're going to be accurate. So, some have thought that because, and we mentioned it last week, if they're born in a Christian environment, that makes them a Christian, but uh, none of that's true. The, uh, if you're born in America, that doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, if you're born in a garage, it doesn't make you an automobile. Uh, you have to uh, be born again to be uh, a Christian and have God as your father. So unless you have had the new birth, you'll not make heaven. But every believer has uh, been born again. All right, we're going to go down now to verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. What it's saying here is this is not something visible that happens. Uh, we can not see the wind, but we can see the effects of the wind, can't we? You know, if you have a lot of leaves in your yard and the wind picks up, what happens? The leaves begin to, to move around your yard. Or the, you look up at the trees, that's a clear indication we got some wind when the trees begin to sway and, and uh, you begin to, and of course in a hurricane, you're really getting to see them. Uh, sway a lot. Sometimes they come toppling down. And uh, you can look at an intersection. And, of course, the news media, every hurricane, you, they, they show sh pictures of the traffic lights swinging uh, back and forth as the wind bounces them around. But you don't see the wind, do you? You simply see the effects of the wind. Well, a physical birth, you can see that. That's something you can see. You can see that newborn baby uh, right after it's born and hear its cries and and uh, hold that little baby, uh, but uh, you can't see the new birth. That's because it's something of the Spirit of God. But yet, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And when you and I lead someone to Christ, when we give them the gospel and they trust the Lord, there is a new birth that occurs that's just as real, or maybe we might want to focus on it as being more real, or at least more important, than the flesh birth, because this is the one that determines whether you go to heaven or not. And so when I talk to somebody and they trust the Lord, I try to remind myself, wow, a miracle has taken place here. Just like a lot of people are stirred by a fleshly birth, a physical birth. You know, there's nothing like a brand new baby that brings a joy to a family and excitement. And people are excited, the baby's been born. What is it, a girl or a boy? How much did it weigh? And and all the little details you want. And they show you these ugly pictures of the newborn because <laughs> none of the newborn look very nice. Uh, they just came out of the womb and they just look all distorted. And, and oh, a beautiful baby. And they show you the picture and they're just all excited. But you can't see the uh, spirit birth. It's something that's of the Spirit of God. That's what Christ is saying here. So we're not talking about a physical birth that you can see. We're talking about a spiritual birth and you can't see it. But you can tell the effects of it. Because, obviously, my whole life is different in that uh, I've chosen a whole new path for my life since I've gotten saved. But uh, you can't see the birth take place. Nobody that night knew that a birth had taken place in the room. Ooh, we think somebody got born here tonight. Uh, nobody knew that I had been born again that night. I trusted the Lord. It's something that happens silently. But uh, the effects of it can later be seen in the life of a person born again who tells others of their experience and lead others to Christ. But it's something like the wind. So the Holy Spirit is invisible like the wind, but yet the consequences of what the wind can do are real. And obviously, uh, you don't want to be in a tornado or a hurricane, or you don't want to expose yourself to those elements because you can, you can be killed, you can be hurt. So then it says in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be. Wow, this was really new stuff for Nicodemus over his head and obviously it's over all of our heads I'm sure because this is a realm where we can't see. Uh, and that's what Christ was saying earlier, you can't see until you become born again. Then you can understand what God is saying here about this new birth. And Jesus says unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Well, the new birth is in the Old Testament, and uh, we find numerous references. I don't think I'm going to go there 
now unless we have time later. But uh, he says, you're a teacher. You should, if you're familiar with the Bible, have recognized that it's there, and we'll maybe point that out later. But uh, it says here, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we do know, and testify that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. Look at verse 12 now, and here this makes this come clear. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And I love that verse because that really did uh, impact me. I remember being of a scientific background and how that uh, sometimes we have to jump from the known to the unknown, from the things that are seen to the things that are unseen. And uh, uh, we obviously do that in the scientific realm. Uh, we talk about atoms, but you've never seen an atom, right? And yet you believe in atoms. And uh, more and more as uh, scientists uh, have discovered more about the atoms, we thought at one time they just were made up of three particles, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons. But now, at least, uh, last time I looked, there were about 36, I think, subatomic uh, atomic particles within each atom. They're not as simple as we once thought, so they're quite complicated. And uh, yet we believe, even though we haven't seen it. But even more than that, you know, in the Bible, it tells us about things that are earthly things that are accurate. The Bible tells us the earth is round thousands of years ago. The Bible tells us that the earth is suspended in space uh, thousands of years ago. The Bible tells us that God created the universe out of his energy long before Einstein ever came along. And uh, there are so many things that are earthly things that we can verify that are true that God spoke to us and told us about before we ever discovered them. And we, Jesus is saying, if you can not believe the earthly things that I tell you, then how will you believe me concerning the heavenly things that I tell you? So in other words, we have to be able to make the leap from an accurate Bible that describes earthly things without error, tells the future, tells us scientific facts and other facts that are absolutely right on, which no other book on the planet does that. I'll never forget while I was at the University of Florida and I was taking some calculus class or whatever and we all had an assignment to take one problem and take it home and work on it and bring it back to class the next day. I worked all night and the next day I found out everybody else in the class did the same thing and we were all sweating it and, and uh, we were all uh, uh, just nervous when the professor came in and he said, how many of you got the problem solved? And we were all like embarrassed, like none of us could raise our hand. He says, well, you couldn't because the problem was not stated correctly in the book. And uh, we all breathed a sigh of relief thinking we were all stupid or something, but, uh, or he would think it's stupid or he would fail us. But uh, I found out that as in college that we were constantly discovering errors in our textbooks. They weren't always correct. And we had assumed, at least I did, the textbook is right, and the professor sent us, I think, on an exploration deal here to teach us a lesson here in that too, that we discovered, whoops, the book was not right, and it was impossible to solve that problem. Nobody could get it, because the, the problem was not even a, a correct uh, problem that you could answer. Well, that was a real opener for me, so I was always more careful then to question whether the book was right. That was a good lesson for me. And I brought that over to the Bible as well. And uh, obviously, uh, we have a book that we can trust. This is a book that is without error. We believe that it's infallible, inerrant. That means without error. And it's a, a God breathed. It is God's word. And so Christ is saying, uh, if I tell you about earthly things, and they're true all the time, then you can expect that what I'm telling you about heavenly things that you can't see are absolutely true. And isn't that wonderful to know that we can uh, trust this book so that I, can, I can't prove heaven or hell to you unless you die. You'll then discover that hell is real and heaven is real but it's going to be too late for you. You need to make that decision before you die. And you can make that decision very comfortably knowing that the Bible is always right about earthly things that it tells you. So you can make that leap very, very comfortably and say, well, this book is always right. And I certainly have confidence that God must have written this book 
because he tells us earthly things that can be verified and checked. And so we can make comfortably the leap to the unknown and say, what he tells us about heaven and about hell and the unseen world are just as accurate. And he's the only one that can really pull back that curtain and let us know about those areas that we don't know about, that we cannot see. Then it says here, and by the way, 12 is a neat verse, I think. And I remember uh, when I first thought about that and, and, and thought it through, how wonderful it is. I said, I've got a great book here that uh, just is not wrong. And I can trust uh, what he says about heaven and not doubt at all that I'm going to heaven, that it's a real place. Uh, this is not metaphorical, as some people would have you believe. It's a real place and we're going to go there. Then it says in verse 13, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What a verse this one is. And a lot of people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There have been people that have ascended to heaven. And uh, what about Elijah? What about Enoch? And so on. They were caught up into heaven, but they didn't ascend. The thought that they ascended means of their own power. There's only one who has ever of his own power, Jesus. You know, uh, Elijah was picked up by a chariot and taken to heaven. Uh, Enoch was translated, but it was God who did it. There's nobody of his volition that said, I want to ascend to heaven right now, see you, and just rose up out of your sight. No man has ever ascended to heaven, but Jesus has, and that's what it's talking about here. And then it says, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, who is the one that did that? Even the Son of Man, that's Jesus. And then it says, which is what? In heaven. That means he's omnipresent. Here again, the glory of God is being displayed in this book. So here we have one who came down from heaven, yet at the same time while he's down from heaven, here on the earth in a human body, he's still up in heaven. Think about that one for a while. That's a little bit heavy, isn't it? So we've jumped from the earthly to the heavenly, and we're talking about a Jesus who ascended of his own power to heaven, but he's the one that descended down to the earth, and at the same time, while he's descended and here on the earth, he's still up in heaven. Figure it out. We have, obviously, a God who is omnipresent, and that means, basically, he's everywhere present. So uh, God is uh, right now in Africa and Europe and Asia, what if you're traveling to Australia and you say, Oh my goodness, I left God back in America. Uh, what will I do until I get back? No, God is present all the places you might visit. And wherever you might go, you can't escape His presence. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. What an exciting concept we have. And the world religions don't describe a God like the Bible describes, which tells me their writings are false, and they don't have the right God, and that we have the right book and the right God and the right Savior, that it's all right here in this wonderful book. And there's a lot here. We are now coming to the conclusion of this class, so we'll probably break it right here.